Well, I'd like you to look at Psalm 26 here that Charles read uh, from to you. And this Psalm has, uh, as all the Psalms, it'll have a, a particular angle on the person and the, the glory of God. And this Psalm does. I'll tell you what it's about. I shared this story at our men's conference. So if you're a man, you heard this this week, but it's a good story, especially for this Psalm. I had a buddy, uh, a girl who was just two years older than me, and she came to the Lord back when she was in high school. She was in Bonham, Texas. And um, when, when she came to college, she was here in the, in the 60s, early 70s, when people were crazy. All right. And she got into the whole counterculture deal. And um, she had her, uh, you know, the, the look, the fringe, the bell bottoms, everything. And she said that even though she had come to know the Lord when she was in high school, that the culture just got its hand on her. And she said, I was places I shouldn't have been with people I shouldn't have been with doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And she said, one day uh, I pulled up to Vertman's, the old bookstore, college bookstore. They're on, uh, I believe it's Hickory or Oak, and she pulled up on it. And she said, I drove a 66 blue Ford Mustang. And on one side of the bumper stickers, on the bumper, there were bumper stickers like she had one that said, uppity women of the world unite. <laughs> Feminism, all right. So she had her feminist stuff over here on the left. And then on the right, she would have honk if you love Jesus. In case of a rapture, this car being occupied, all of her Christian stuff over here. And then all of her, her feminism stuff over here. And she said, I went into Vertman's and when I came out, I saw a piece of paper under my windshield and I thought, I hope they didn't take it. Then saw, no, somebody written me a note. She thought, I thought it was somebody that recognized my car, said, let's meet for lunch. And I pulled out the piece of paper and she said, my life was never the same. And I pulled out that piece of paper. And she said, the paper had one word written on it. It simply said, Decide. She said, it may have been written by an angel, but it said it was probably some irritated Christian <laughs> that just looked at it and saw the world and God, would that you were hot or cold, but you were lukewarm and just wrote down, decide. I think they put dad burn it or something like that <laughs> under it. You remember God's words to, through Elijah to Israel, how long will you hop between two forks? If the Lord is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Remember the words of Joshua? If it be good in your sight to serve the gods of Egypt that you left or the gods of Canaan where you are, feel free. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You make the call who you're going to serve. Jesus said, would that you were hot or cold, lukewarm, I'll spew you. I'm a pretty easy subject whenever I go out to eat. I'm, I, I can put up with anything except tepid coffee. <laughs> like all truly regenerate men, I cannot handle tepid coffee. And I will say to the waitress, dear, I can't handle this. Heat it up. Could you, what do you say? Uh, room temperature, Dr. Pepper. Cannot be drunk. <laughs> it's in Habakkuk, I think, or somewhere that you can't drink it. It has to be just above freezing. You have to put it in ice. That's when you drink Dr. Pepper. In between, I can't handle it. And that is what Psalm 26 is about, is about what Teddy Roosevelt used to call the mug wumps, guys with their mug on one side of the line and their wumps on the other. When you're in the middle, caught in the middle, get off the fence, go one way or the other. Well, and stay with me here. In Psalm 26, in verse one, it is a request of God. He makes a divine request. He says, vindicate me, O Lord, 
Meaning, judge me. Meaning, show publicly that I am faithful. Because I've walked in my integrity and I've trusted in the Lord, the Hebrew says, without slipping, without being inconsistent, without backsliding. To vindicate means that God declares you publicly as in the right. He supports you. Uh, when, the, when Korah, you remember the book of Numbers? There was a Kohathite that carried the ark and his name was Korah. He was of the Kohathites that bore the ark. And he didn't like the idea. Numbers chapter 10, Israel leaves Sinai and starts toward the promised land. Right after they took off, I believe it's Numbers 14, Korah held a uprising against Moses because he didn't like the idea that as a, a, a Kohathite, he could not enter into the, the holy place. Uh, basically, he had a problem with Judaism. Judaism teaches you don't come to God. God appoints the person and the sacrifice by which you are represented. It's called Christianity. And they didn't like Judaism. And so he got um, a mutiny in Israel against the idea of federal representation, particularly against Moses. And uh, God said, have them come out first thing in the morning and I'm gonna show you who I choose. And they all showed up. And if you remember, the earth opened and swallowed them. And the leaders of Israel that were not among the, the Kohathite the, of Korah, the fire came forth and consumed them, which is a tip off <laughs> that God did not accept you. All right. Uh, do you remember Miriam and Aaron had a problem with Moses, particularly big sister? I don't like the idea that he's the one that announces we're all holy, me and Aaron too, right Aaron? Yeah, 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 yeah. And God struck her a leper and Moses said, God have mercy. And God said, no, if her father had but spit in her face, she would go six days unclean. We're gonna stop everything and the entire nation is gonna stop for a week and we're gonna recognize that a wrong was done. That's called God vindicating you. Uh, did Absalom raise his hand against David? Did God vindicate David when he's hanging from his hair in a tree with three spears stuck in him? Did Saul uh, rebel against the edict of Samuel that David would be king? Yes, he did. And he fell on his own sword. Uzzah rebelled against God and decided to go into the Holy of Holies, though only the priest could do it because he had been king for 52 years and I guess he thought he deserved it. And the, the priest normally on his forehead has holy unto the Lord. You remember what broke out on Uzzah's forehead? Leprosy. God vindicated his name. And this is what David is saying. God, I need you to publicly demonstrate that I'm one of the good guys. And in verse one, here's why. I have walked in my, the Hebrew says, my completeness, my oneness, that there's no duplicity in me. The word we use for this is the word integrity. Integer, remember your math means one digit. Uh, integrate. To become one. Integral, everything comes together. Integrity means that you're not a hypocrite. You don't have a public life and a private life. It means that everything has, oh, when you talk about getting a knee operation, that you may lose the integrity of the joint. And so David says, I'm the real thing. And God, you know this. Uh, and in verse 26, he walked and integrity. He didn't go from event to event. There was a consistent, practical obedience of God day by day. And he said, I did it without slipping, without going good for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden disappearing from church about backsliding and going backwards and having my fill of my ways. 
David says, you've watched my life and you've seen consistency. And in verse two, it'll be, he, he pleads for an open life. He says, God, examine me, try me, test me. That this vindication, he's not asking God to play favorites. He says, you look at my life and you look at my heart. Remember Matthew 23, woe unto you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside's full of corruption. You're like a tomb. You're whitewashed on the outside, but on the inside is dead men's bones. You tithe dill and mint and cumin, these little spices, but you neglect the love of God and justice and the weight of your things. And so he is saying, God, I don't have a public life and a private life. Question, who was the money keeper of the 12? Judas. Had he fooled everybody on the apostles? He had. Who didn't he fool? Jesus. One of you will betray me and I know who you are. And so David says, God, you see my heart. Incidentally, what are we supposed to do before we take communion? Examine. You check your heart, God. This is me and you. Well, in verse 3, this request is not because David is proud in his own personal confidence in his moral strength. In verse 3, he has a broken heart. Your hesed. Hasidic love, your loving kindness, your loyal love, your covenantal husband to a wife, parent to a child, faithfulness is before my eyes. This was David's motivation. Everywhere I look, I see your goodness and your kindness to this nation and this kindness to me. There's a story about in the Civil War, there was an abolitionist that went down south. They would go down and purchase slaves and set them free to go up north. And this abolitionist came down and there were these two slaves on a block. One was a dispirited older man who was beaten down. The other was a young man whose eyes blazed with hate. And this abolitionist bought him and purchased him and he stepped down from the platform and he said, his eyes glared at me. And they undid his manacles upon his request and they dropped off and he took the certificate of ownership and he tore it up and he said, you are free. And the story says that the slave fell at his feet and said, I'll serve you forever. Now that's what the gospel is. I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice. So David says, your goodness and loving kindness is before my eyes. Why should we walk in integrity? Because it will make me successful? No, because God was faithful to me. Amen? God was faithful to me. Uh, the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, one died for all. Therefore, all died. That they who live should live no more for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. C.T. Studd, the missionary, said, if Christ is God and died for me, then there is no sacrifice that I cannot make for him. And so in verse four and five, there is decisiveness. I do not sit with deceitful men. I will not go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I do not and I will not. These men, one commentator said, these were wealthy men, powerful men with short-term success. Will it ultimately come around on them? Yeah, but for a short time, wickedness can avail itself. David said, though it could be politically expedient to me, I will not compromise with these men. I will trust in you. And he calls it in verse uh, five, an assembly. It's the Hebrew word, a company, that they were a block, a B-L-O-C. They were like the Sanhedrin of Jesus' day. 
These are a, a company of men that want him to throw in and he will not do it. As a matter of fact, when he says, I hate, in Hebrew, that's the idea of non-preferment. Whoever does not hate his father, mother, sister, brother, even his own life is not worthy to be my disciple. You cannot say yes to the world and, and yes to God at the same time. And so I have not deferred to these people. I'll give you a good story of this. How many of you are old enough to remember John Kennedy? Okay. And you remember that election, he and Nixon? It was neck and neck. And his daddy, Joe Kennedy, Joe, old Joe Kennedy, uh, wanted desperately for his children to be, like he said, to sit up to the table, to be, though they were Irish immigrants, to be American royalty. And he wanted one of them to be president. And he, the first one was going to be Joe Jr., but he got killed in World War II, so it went to John. And to be sure that he got the vote, America had a problem with a Catholic being a president because you had to be loyal to the Constitution and to the Pope at the same time. It made people nervous. And so he wanted to, to swing that election. And to do that, he knew he had to get the Catholic vote of the Northeast. And that was the Teamsters, as in the Teamster Union, as in Jimmy Hoffa. And so what he did is the guy that controlled the Teamsters was Sam Giancana. I hope you don't know him <laughs> because he ran the mob. Well, he wasn't going to talk with Sam Giancana. That would look bad. But he did know that there was a friend of John Kennedy's that was sleeping with the same woman that Sam Giancana was sleeping with. His name was Frank Sinatra. And he didn't want to talk with Giancana, but he would talk with Sinatra. And so he got one of his in-laws, whose name was Peter Lawford, as in the Rat Pack. And he said to Peter to say to Frank, to say to Sam, to say to Jimmy, I need to visit with you. So he met on a golf course with Frank Sinatra and said, I need you to ask Sam to throw the Teamsters behind John. And he did. And John Kennedy won. And as soon as he did, he appointed the Attorney General. Do you all remember who was the Attorney General under John Kennedy? Robert Kennedy. And you remember what he went after first? Organized crime. Sam Giancana, Jimmy Hoffa, and down south, the New Orleans mob. And have you ever heard of quid pro quo? <laughs> He's a running back for the Tennessee Titans. It's quid pro quo. Yeah. Quid pro quo means I'll do, I'll scratch your back, but you're got to scratch mine. And so we'll benefit each other. I'll give something, but I'm going to get something. And so they did the quid, but they didn't get the pro quo. Organized crime got him in, and then all of a sudden he turned on him. There's called honor among thieves. There's certain people you don't do that to. And one of them is the mob. And so shortly thereafter, uh, they cut off the head of the snake. John Kennedy got shot. And Bobby Kennedy got shot. And the word is that their common lover, Marilyn Monroe, turned up dead. Don't send me books, okay? <laughs> don't, don't send me books. But probably after these years, that is probably the major consensus that it was more than just old Lee Harvey, that it was a very uh, elaborate mob hit. It was that simple. You don't do that. Now, I wish I could have uh, shared this with dear Jack before he did that. Don't climb in bed with somebody that is going to come back on you. Amen.
better to walk with God. Well, David said, I'm not going to do that. It, good story for you. David had a son named Solomon, and he wanted to go beyond his boundaries and make Israel something that was a world power. And the way you did then was like you did in the Middle Ages. You did it by marital alliances. Y'all ever heard of the Habsburg dynasty where a handful of people intermarried throughout all of Europe? And so Solomon began the Solomonic dynasties. And his first wife was from Pharaoh's daughter. And he knew he couldn't have her in his house and in the temple. So he made her his own private house. I'll have my public life and then my private life will be over here. Well, one nation wasn't enough. Pretty soon you had 700 wives. You know, I'd have stopped at like 350, 400 myself. I, you know, 700. But those were all alliances. And uh, he didn't think at first it would turn his heart away, did it? Yeah, and God took 80%. What's five, six? The northern 10 tribes, he lost them. He kept two tribes. Two goes into ten, five, six. That's a, that's a lot, okay? He that saves his life will lose it. So he lost it. Solomon, don't do this. Don't be in the middle. Don't be a mugwump. You got to declare. Well, in verse six, this was what David's greatest longing was, why he wanted to be pure. It wasn't just to be a successful king. I'll wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar. Those are the words of a Levitical priest that if he was going to serve God at the altar and worship him, that he had, you remember in the temple, you've got the brass laver that you would wash your hands in. You could serve him as a priest, but you had to wash your hands and your feet. Does that remind you of something? At the Last Supper, when we're going to have fellowship with Christ, and before we eat, you got to do something. What do you got to do? Wash your feet. Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if you don't, we have no rapport. You got to be honest. You got to be clean. Well, wash my head, my hands, everything. No, he that is clean, you guys, you're saved. You only have to wash your feet. That's all you got to do. When you come in from outside, what does mama always say you to do? Wipe your feet. If you're going to fellowship with me, then before you do, day by day, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For a child to have fellowship with his parents, he has to honor the code. And that means that you apologize or you get whooped and then you cry and apologize, and now you're back in the standard. And that is what David means right here. I want to serve God, and so I will be clean. David's greatest fear is to be disqualified, that I can only be a politician, but I can't serve God. Uh, and if you'll look in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 7, not only to serve God at the altar, but to proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all of your wonders. That's the other thing that a priest would do. He was the teaching clientele of Israel. Malachi chapter two, the words of a priest should, I'm sorry, the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his lips because he is the Malachi, the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Remember Psalm 51, the penitential Psalm? David said he would confess his sins. And then he said, I will teach transgressors, I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted to thee. That was David's greatest longing. One commentator has said rightly, David could not have served as a priest because you have to be a Levite. David was from Judah. But as one author said, and rightly so, 
David understood the higher substance to the symbol of the priest, that all men could serve God if their hearts were right, and they can. Uh, one has said that David was a New Testament man in an Old Testament dispensation. And so this is his highest joy. To proclaim the wonders of God is probably the Old Testament testimony of what God has done. To proclaim with a voice of thanksgiving is to add his present voice into the litany of God's greatness. David will join with Miriam to talk about God's greatness. Uh, this is the greatest fear that a Christian should have, that because of my sin that I would be disqualified. Amen? That I will be disqualified that I will not be able to represent God. You know, Chuck Swindoll said that when he was in the military, he was a Marine at Korea. He said, he was talking to the seminary one day. He said, boys, I've seen men court-martialed that would not play by the rules and rebelled. I've seen them court-martialed. I've seen them rip the stripes from their shoulders. He said, I have seen men in the ministry court-martialed. He said, you don't want to do that. The way you do it is you don't wash your hands and you have a duplicitous life. Don't do that. And so, my greatest joy, God, is that I can serve you. Verse 8, he says, God, I, it does, I have a deep love. In verse 5, I hate. Verse 8, Lord, what's the next two words? I love. If I have my choice of the, to dwell in the tents of wickedness, I would love rather the habitation of your house. That's what I love, is to be able to serve in your house and in the place where your glory dwells, the Shekinah. Does that remind you of a verse? The word became flesh and tabernacled literally among us and we beheld his glory the Shekinah as only the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth the, the presence of God then was the temple where's the presence of God now it's in Christ and the body of Christ that's his glory and so I give you an illustration of this I've, I go to all my reunions I went to my 50th just a few months ago. When, when I grew up, back before the earth's crust hardened, <laughs> back in 1950, when I, when I grew up, all our elementary school, we all went together. We all went to junior high together and we all went to high school together. Very few of my kids I grew up with moved. Back in those days, you didn't move so much. But we, we were all together. And so when I would go to my reunions, I loved just to sit and watch these faces walk by and to holler at them. Hey, Edgar Geis, come here. What have you been doing? And I would just relish. I would go early and just enjoy these people. But invariably, as the reunion wore on, it was BYOB. Are you with me? Bring your own bottle. And so... Uh, I had changed. I was a new creature from when I graduated. My class of 69 was not, however. And so we'd be sitting around and by later in the evening, we began to retreat into 1969. And uh, even though I so enjoyed being there, there's only one reunion that I stayed for the whole time. Because by the second night, I realized uh, I'm homesick. Even though I was with my buddies, that I needed to be in the house. And so I would speed back on Saturday night, on Sunday morning, to be with my people. You dig? that We can't go back anymore. And so David says, I love to be in your house he said, I love the place of your habitation. 
in verse 9 and verse 10, he has a clear perspective. What's going to happen to those who differ with him? The last chapter hasn't been written. In verse 9, don't, and the Hebrew is, don't gather my soul. Some have think that John the Baptist had this in mind when he talked about the coming of Christ, the last voice of God to Israel. And he said that the ax is being laid at the root of the tree. If it doesn't bear fruit, it's coming down. And then he said, the winnowing fork is in his hand. Y'all know what a winnowing fork is? It's where you go to the grain and you toss it up with this rake and the wind carries away the shaft. The grain falls down. He said the winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clean his threshing floor thoroughly. The grain he will gather into his barn. The shaft he will gather and burn with unquenchable fire. David says, I love your house. Don't gather my soul with men of, with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed. In verse 10, who live for the moment in whose hand is a wicked scheme, whose right hand is full of bribes. Do they succeed momentarily? Yes. Do they get gathered? Yes, they do. Their story ends in Acts 20. Depart into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, his messengers. It's a family reunion. Eternity is a family reunion. The new Jerusalem, the lake of fire. And so God, don't gather my soul with them. You know, the book of Habakkuk, When's the last time you read Habakkuk? You've heard me say before, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and you run into Habakkuk? And he says, how'd you like my book? In the book of Habakkuk, God says, why do the nations uh, labor for fire? Why do they labor for what's going to burn? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God like the waters covers the sea. God said, I've got the last say and his glory is gonna be from sea to sea. Why do the nations labor for fire? Second Peter, the present heavens and earth by God's word is reserved for fire. The next time that you go down to buy a Mercedes, look at that, reserved for fire. Your brand new house reserved for fire. So enjoy it. This world is reserved for fire. Kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So their time is coming. Nice guys finish last, but bad guys go to hell. So he said, don't get so excited about temporal short-term stuff. And so... These guys, they're going to be gathered up. God, I love your house, not the fire. You got to see from God's perspective. And in verse 11, he now has a lifelong resolve. Do those first four words look familiar? But as for me, you remember a guy who said, as for me in my house, I don't care what they're going to do. And incidentally, The guys that he's going to separate from are Jews, those that are ostensibly in God's family. As we look at the cross section of, quote, Christianity, Christendom, are there a lot of, quote, professing Christians that are no more children of God than chalk is cheese, Spurgeon would say? They are not. We're not, I'm not going to be part of that bunch that denies the inerrancy of the Bible. I'm not going to be part of that bunch that takes on theistic evolution, that goes egalitarian as opposed to complementarian, the view of women, men and women. I'm not going to do that. If they want to do it, if all the Episcopalians 
want to do it? If all the Methobacterians want to do it, if Our Lady of the Creek wants to do it, or the fire baptized tongues of screaming, whatever, they're free to do it. But as for me, are you that defiant? Francis Schaeffer said, in our day, you got to teach your child to rebel. I will not do that. As for me, I will walk in my oneness, my integrity. I'm going to be the real deal. And then lest you think that David had a self-confidence, he says, redeem me means deliver me. I can't do this by myself. Let me stop you just a minute. Was there a guy when Jesus said, you will all turn and run away, who said, quote, though all fall away, I will follow you to prison and to death. Who said that? Was it James the Less, little Jimmy? It was not. Who said that? Peter, the rock. Though all may fall away, boom, I'm Simon Peter. Remember what Christ said? No, you're not going to fall away. You're going to fall away three times. I've got to beat the pride out of you. Paul said, the grace of God did not prove lenient toward me or vain, but I labored all the more. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. I am what I am by the grace of God. Look what God has done. So unless you abide in me and I and my words abide in you, you will bear no fruit. You will accomplish nothing. So David says, I'm going to walk in my integrity. Help! Day by day, I need your grace. And then he said, lest you think that I am worthy, be, what's your word? Gracious. I need the grace of God. Paul said, for this purpose I labor, striving according to his power that mightily works within me. Look what God will do for me. And in verse 12, here is the joyful future. So David says in verse 11, uh, I have walked in my integrity, verse one, I shall. I plan on going to the end. Are you with me? Laying aside every encumbrance and sin that so easily entangles us, run with endurance the lane set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and then sat down at the right hand of God. And so let's be like him. Go all the way to where your last words are. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. It's finished. It's done. And so David says, as a result, my foot stands on a level place. My life is solid. Y'all ever read Edgar Allan Poe, or was it Guy de Maupassant? I forget. Help me, Vicki. Uh, Telltale Heart. Poe. Remember Edgar Allan Poe and Telltale Heart? The old guy, the young guy kills that old guy, buries him underneath the floorboards. The cops come looking. And he hears, dum, 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 dum. And he, rec- he says, the cops have got to hear this. They're just making fun of me. And all of a sudden he loses it, says, look under there. What exposed the guy? His telltale heart, his guilt. Nothing's worse than you go cheat on your wife and you're wondering, did that guy who I signed John Doe in, did he know me? How do you pay when you go cheat? You ever thought about that? I mean, do you pay with a credit card? You can't do that. Do you go to the ATM? But then your wife says, why did you take out $170? Ah, do you you pay with like chickens and goats? Do you take change in a shoebox? Did somebody see me? 
If you embezzle, you're always waiting for that examiner to come into your office. Could I speak with you just a second? How do you make what you do and drive a Bentley? What are you going to do with your money? You're always worried when you cheat on your income tax. You're always ready for that IRS agent to come knocking. It'll make you old before your time. My foot stands on a level place. There's nothing greater than having a clear conscience. Amen? It makes you feel you're so... When I can go to bed at night and not wonder about being caught. There was a guy up just north of us years ago, was a bivocational pastor, worked for the city. Uh, came time to give a report on the city's plans, set up his computer, and out he hit the wrong button. And out comes child pornography. A thousand pictures that he had sent ahead, which is a felony. And he couldn't turn it off. And all of the powers that be sat and watched him. I would be nervous about hitting the wrong button. You know, nothing is more wonderful than a clear conscience. David said, my foot is in a level place. Did you ever memorize Longfellow's The Village Blacksmith? Beneath the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, a mighty Baptist is he. No, that ain't right. <laughs> With large and sinewy hands and talking about the honest labor of a good man and how he looks the whole world in the eye for he fears, owes not any man. It's a marvelous thing to be right with God. My foot stands on a level place and in the congregations, plural, future, I shall bless the Lord. I am going to get to be a part of the choir of the faithful. You can mention my name among the faithful. Feel free. And that's what David looks forward to. Isn't this a great psalm? Let me show you something. Look at Judges chapter 8, just real quick. Joshua judges Samuel. Look at Judges and in chapter 8, you see the victory of Gideon. And he has defeated the Midianites. And he and his 300 men are pursuing them across the Jordan, where they came up one way and they're fleeing seven, like God said they would. And in Judges chapter 8, in uh, verse 5, in verse 4, it says they cross the Jordan and they are weary yet pursuing. They're going after the enemy to remove them. In verse 5, he said to the men of Sukkoth, a little city way out on the, right on the border of Israel. He said, please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me. They are weary and he says, I'm doing work for the nation. I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. Meaning you guys didn't go to battle with us. Remember how Gideon got his soldiers? Whoever brings water up to his mouth, he gets to fight. You stick your head down in the creek, you don't get to fight. These were the guys that didn't show up to fight. He says, all I'm asking you to do is give a cold cup of water to one of these little ones. I want you to be fellow workers with the truth. You may not battle, but you can support the guys that do. I need you to declare who you're for. I need you to help us. You know what they said in verse 6? The leaders of Sukkoth said, 
are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands? Meaning, boys, I don't see that the heads of these guys are already in your hands. You're asking me, Gideon, to take a risk. What if you don't win? Then these guys are going to come back on us for aiding and abetting, and they're going to bulldoze our city. Now, we're not going to be against you, but we're not going to be for you any either. We're going to take our seat in the middle. We're, gonna, we're not going to vote on this. Not to decide is to decide. Anybody want to guess how this narrative is going to end? In verse 7, all right, he says, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, he says, yes, gentlemen, we are going to win. I'll promise you. God promised us victory and we're going to win. And when that happens, I'm going to come back here. You ever heard of, of uh, kicking butt and taking names? This is where it comes from in the Hebrew. When I come back, I'm going to have a roll call. And I'm going to take you guys. And I am going to literally trample your bodies with the thorns and the, of the wilderness and with briars. The curse. You didn't want to take a stand. Well, you just did. And I'm coming back. And I'm going to deal with you. In other words, he said, you shouldn't have been afraid of Zeba and Zalmunna. Who does he say you should have been afraid of? Should have been afraid of God. Jesus said, I am coming to the strong man's house, Satan. And I have bound the strong man, which he did. And now he said, I am plundering his possessions. I'm taking people out from the devil. And I am transferring him into the kingdom of God's dear son. And then Jesus said, he that doesn't gather with me scatters. You're with me or you're against me. Decide. Decide which way you're going to go. One way or the next. I had a, uh, when I was in seminary, a guy named Haddon Robinson. He was a professor of homiletics. He told the story to us, all of us seminary boys. He said, listen, he was talking about the horror of a Christian being court-martialed. And incidentally, that doesn't happen just with guys in the pulpit. It can happen to women in the church, to men in the church, and that doesn't have to be immorality. It can be anger, an arrogant spirit, a lack of being a team man to where you acknowledge sin and you don't deal with it. And so he was talking about it. He said, we had a guy at the seminary, a, a boy whose father ran a Bible college and pastored a church in the Southeast. He ran off with the Bible college's money and he ran off with the money with his secretary. He folded the Bible college and he irreparably harmed that church simply because of lust and materialism. And he ran off. And his son was still at Dallas Seminary. And he knew that Dr. Robinson had attended seminary with his father. He said, could you talk with him? He said, I'd love to, but he left our shores to go off the coast, wait for the statute of limitations to run out. Well, he finally came back. And Dr. Robinson said he looked like a hundred years had been added to his life. And he was, it was bitter what his life had become. And hadn't talked to him. And he said to him, the man was so far gone. He said, there's nothing to come back to. And hadn't said to him, what do I say to your boy? Because he still got your name. What do I tell him? And he said, hadn't you tell him this, that a man who walks out of fellowship with God walks on the edge of an abyss because he didn't fall all of a sudden. 
he had started nursing something in his life, a failure to walk in integrity. He who walks out of fellowship with God walks on the edge of an abyss. Tape ministry said, what are you going to name this song? Name it, decide. Father in heaven, compromise as the child of a lesser God. It is the Philistines who throw their idols into the caves and into the holes of the ground because their idols failed them. They had eyes but could see not, ears could hear not, mouths could speak not. They had feet but could not move and hands that could not act. We have a God so mighty that he cannot be confined to finite things. A God that we take by faith because no visible thing could be worthy of him. Only the finger painting of the cosmos can give rise to who he is in the dark. A God that if we did look upon him, we could not live. And so to this living God, uh, we kiss the sword and we bow to his feet and we promise him fealty and loyalty. May there be in our lives, God, nothing that is less than the praise that is due our great God and our great King, who became one of us, who confined himself to a womb and then to a cross and vacated an empty tomb that we could have heaven opened. Find us faithful in this time of the Great Commission. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.